Awesome. Uh, it seems like everyone can hear me. So we'll start the webinar. So uh, today's webinar, we wanted to speak about the CASEL legislation in Canada and uh, how, you know, you as a business owner would need to prepare for it. Um, and what is it, you know, essentially CASEL legislation and so on and so forth. So, we're, you know, by end of this webinar, you should be very informed of, you know, basically how this will affect you and how you need to prepare for it. Um, so, the first thing is essentially what is CASEL. And CASEL is an essentially regulatory framework for permission-based marketing, including, this is essentially, uh, it's the legislation that's been put in place to, you know, essentially regulate the type of communication that's made to, you know, your contacts from your leads, your former students and members to your, you know, existing active student. And it falls, uh, it's any communication under the category of email, uh, mobile and text messages, and uh, social media, or any other digital uh, means of communication. So if any other communication that you can think of that is digitally, it'll essentially fall under this legislation. So the entire thing is all about consent. And essentially, what is consent? Consent is permission from a contact that a business may send them certain communication. So you must essentially have uh, essentially approval from the contacts from your lead students or former students that you are able to communicate with them and you are able to actually send them information. There's essentially two types of consent that uh, basically uh, this uh, it's categorized under this legislation. The first type is an express consent. This is the best consent that you can actually have, uh, and I, I'll tell you why in in few moments. Uh, what is an express consent? It's a clear permission obtaining electronically, orally, or in writing that contact may have asked to receive emails. So. Just to essentially go over that again, it's a clear permission that your contact is provided uh, is providing you to obtain, uh, and it could be obtained electronically. So it could be through uh, forms or you know essentially email. It could be orally, so in a verbal conversation to over the phone or in person, you're able to actually get that agreement, or in writing. So it could be a form that they can manually fill out and actually provide you uh, that essentially consent. And the consent, you know, and we're going to get into how that, you know, essentially uh, uh, consent should be gathered because there's also rules and regulation of what basically should be included when you are getting the consent. The second type of consent is implied consent. Cons uh, this is consent that is infer inferred based on actions such as having an existing business relationship. So what basically the legislation has put together is, you know, a set of rules that will allow you to communicate to a contact depending on the type of relationship that you have. And we'll go over that in detail in a few moments. So how do I get express consent? As I said, this is my personal, uh, personally recommended type of consent. And how you get it is basically... Um, is you have to clearly indicate that you're asking permission to send them electronic messages. So it doesn't matter if it's essentially verbal, written, or digitally, you know, however means of basic method you're using to be able to actually get that consent, you need to specifically mention that you are asking permission to send electronic messages. The second thing, you know, when you are getting the consent, you need to clearly indicate what organization is requesting permission. So this would be your organization name, you know, your logo perhaps. Uh, specifically, the business name is a required piece uh, of information here. So if you have a piece of document that you're asking your students to sign or your members to sign, you just need to make sure that the business name is on top of it. The next thing, on any piece of basic document that asking consent from people, you need to be able to tell people uh, what type of information they will be receiving from that point onward. So if it's a marketing piece of information, it needs to mention that. If it's uh, updates about your business, it needs to mention that. It needs to clearly indicate what type of material they will be receiving. Is it through via, uh, via email, you know, uh, text messages, and so on and so forth. 
you uh, the other piece of information you must have essentially uh, uh, you know uh, information on that document explaining that the contact at any time can unsubscribe uh, so this would essentially uh, just essentially require that any time you know moving forward after providing the consent you'll be able to unsubscribe either by contacting us or you know by clicking on the you know button uh, button on the emails next thing is on that document, you must include a mailing address and one of the following information. It could be an email address, a website address, or a phone number. This is also a requirement that basically the CASEL uh, legislation has put in place. Now, why I like actually express consent is, uh, you know, uh, is, is because that when an express consent is provided to a business, that's good forever. There is no actually expired date on it. You are able to contact that you know customer for you know essentially the rest of their lifetime unless they specifically tell you that they don't want to receive communication from you anymore or unsubscribe from your emails. But this is that's why you know I, I personally believe although it's a little bit more work and you know you'll be able to understand why compared to implied consent consent but it's actually worth it because upon getting that consent then you're good forever you'll be able to actually essentially communicate with that uh, individual uh, for as long as you want unless they actually specifically ask you not to be contacted so this is all the information in regards to what is an express consent now we also have the implied consent and what is in uh, basically implied consent is a consent that's based on set of rules right so you know, such as you know having an existing business with a uh, business relationship with someone uh, meaning that they made a purchase or donation or some sort of uh, you know something like that there are different types basically uh, uh, of categories of basically situations that fall under implied consent some of the examples are one example could be in an essentially uh, on a seminar or a conference if you're exchanging Changing business cards with someone, uh, you're able to essentially contact that person unless they specifically on their business card piece of information that has their email address mentions that you are not able to contact them uh, and send them email. So that is something that's ex uh, you know expect uh, acceptable by the Castle legislation. Uh, the timeline, you know, uh, for something like that, if you receive someone's email address, uh, you know, it would be two years that you can you know com uh, continue communication with them. Uh, the other method is if they're, you know, essentially recipient's email address has been uh, published somewhere, you know, uh, you know, either on a piece of paper, or on a website, or you know, or any type of documentation, and it doesn't specifically talk about, uh, you know, uh, not having permission to send them emails. Um, another uh, kind of example is a customer that just recently made a purchase or you know uh, or made a donation to, towards your business that's also a category that you know under castle legislation it allows you to actually communicate to those type of people uh, next thing is anyone that's kind of under any type of agreement with you so if you guys have a student or a member agreement with your basically members um, you know Technically, as long as you're actually in the agreement, you're able to actually communicate with them. Upon uh, expiry of the agreement, you have also two years up to, from that point onwards to, uh, to still communicate to essentially what, uh, quote unquote, your former customers. So. The only challenge with this is, you know, the implied consent is great because that means that you can, you know, uh, still communicate to your students uh, without any issues. However, uh, the biggest issue is that there is a timeline that, you know, essentially there's a clock that will end after the two-year mark. So you must, uh, you know, essentially uh, uh, renew that relationship one way or another or get express consent from, uh, from that contact. So the question that everyone asks and you know most people are actually very nervous about right now is what's going to happen with my existing contacts? Well, simply you must get uh, or it's best for you to get express consent from everyone. Now, as I mentioned, you know earlier if there are still active clients with you or they recently ended the relationship with you, you still have some time to be able to contact them. But it's best for you to start actually uh, you know, uh, try getting the express consent from them now. 
One thing is right now, you know, most customers in Canada are very aware of this situation as most of the businesses are contacting them one way or another to be able to get the consent. So the, it's a perfect timing right now to be able to actually go after that. Uh, now you can, you know, get the express consent through any of the methods that we previously uh, spoke about digitally. For example, using an email or an online form, you can get it through a phone or a written, like, you know, essentially a written document that they can sign. And all of this is essentially a method that you can contact them. Having said that, again, you have implied consent to be able to contact your existing customers who are in, con in contract with you. In addition, any customer that's recently left, you have up to two years to be able to contact them. One thing that it's going to potentially help you uh, in uh, improving your rate and getting consent uh, is maybe offering something in return. You know, if you send email to everyone, it's very likely that you're not going to get a response from every single contact that you have. However, by you know uh, offering some giveaways such as discounts to your pro shop items or to your store, uh, coupons that they can use on certain products, or maybe even a download of an ebook if you essentially are able to actually put that together, uh, these are all great methods to be able to create more incentive for people to consent or provide that consent to you. One thing that you know it's uh, it's kind of good for us to know uh, is that there is a part of the legislation that allows us to have a grace period up until July 1st of 2017. Now what this means now uh, you know this is very important and you know you don't you shouldn't rely on this but essentially what the government is saying is up to uh, July 1st of 2017 if for your existing contacts that you have today not the new ones that you're going to gain after July 1st of this year, but the existing contacts that's in your database today. If you still, you know, uh, essentially, you know, for some reason you have contacted them incorrectly, but you show a history that you are trying your best to be able to, uh, you know, essentially follow the rules and regulation, there is a essentially grace period. They won't essentially uh, go after you. A court, you know, per se. Uh, having said that, you shouldn't rely on this. Uh, they put this in place as, you know, I believe uh, the government understands that it's going to take some time for everyone to, you know, essentially follow this legislation fully. And also, uh, up until July 1st of 2017, uh, individuals are not able to sue the business. Uh, they're not able to actually file a class uh, action lawsuit against the business for getting these types of communication. As of July 1st of 2017, each individual, each customer or lead that you have can actually sue the business. So that's why it becomes, you know, essentially very important that after that point, everything must be perfect. You are not able to contact anyone that you don't have consent anymore. Prior to that, the government is the only body and entity that can actually essentially fine a business. So, and they, they, you know, are providing a grace period. It's not fully documented of, you know, who they will essentially con consider as uh, someone that, you know, could apply for a grace period or, you know, uh, could essentially get their fines waived off. But, you know, essentially the only stuff that I read about it was essentially as long as you are showing that you are doing your best and you are doing the necessary steps to be able to follow this legislation, they'll be okay. They'll, you know, they won't push you too hard. Now, um, again, to go, kind of go over this, what are the different methods for you to get express consent? As I mentioned, again, express consent is the best method to actually go around. Uh, it's much better than implied consent since there is no essentially deadline on it or, uh, you know, uh, since the expiry date on uh, your permission. Uh, one way is to uh, orally, essentially contacting your uh, contact list and getting that uh, information from people and getting the consent from people. Uh, that's going to be very handy and very easy for your existing contacts or students. Uh, you know, uh, you'll be able to do that no problem, uh, depending obviously on the size of your list. Uh, the other uh, method is uh, getting a written consent. Uh, so you can actually create a sign-up sheet, maybe an Excel sheet with the multiple columns, have all the information that I previously mentioned, such as your business name, ability for them to subscribe, your address and your phone number or email address, all that information on the sign-up sheet, and have your students and members as they walk in sign off, essentially, on those sheets. 
Um, next thing is electronically, uh, ability to send them an email and ask them to actually provide consent to you um, or through any other methods such as lead capture forms. Now, one thing is, uh, obviously, when you're actually uh, getting the information digitally, it's, uh, you know, there is a history of, you know, how that information has been gathered. Uh, essentially, uh, how digitally, we, uh, you know, the information is captured and IP addresses also should be recorded. So, you know, essentially, there is a proof of, uh, you know, the person actually providing consent. Now, when you're going, uh, you know, utilizing any of the offline methods, meaning that orally or written, you have to keep track of the location and the process that you followed uh, so it can be presented as proof for feature. So after 2017, if someone essentially comes in or wants to sue the business, you have the, all the documentation in hand saying that you know, on this date, in this location, we follow this process to be able to get your consent and you essentially sign that sheet. If you don't have this, you know, it might become problematic for you in future. So be very careful if you are getting offline consent, make sure that you actually track all this information. Um, as I mentioned, you know, when you are getting offline consent, you must actually have certain piece of information such as business name, contact info like the address and the phone number or email address, uh, in addition to, uh, you know, basically the ability for them to unsubscribe and why what they are consenting to, so what type of information will they be receiving moving forward. So there is essentially few questions that you can ask to know when essentially the CASA legislation applies. Uh, I've essentially put together a, a very simple flowchart. As long as you follow this and as long as you get yes on uh, uh, answer of yes to all these boxes, that means you have to follow the CASA legislation. If any of the answers here is no, then that means that you don't really fall under this legislation and you can communicate using the uh, similar rules and regulation that was applied to you in the past. So the first question to always ask is, is this message electronic? Was this message sent by text? voice broadcast or, you know, essentially any type of voice mechanism, uh, video, image or email. These are essentially the methods that are considered quote unquote as electronic messages. So as long as uh, your message doesn't fall within these categories, you're good. You can communicate using the, you know, under the same rules and regulations as before. If it falls under any of these categories, essentially you're right now consider as uh, you need to follow the castle uh, legislation. The next question is, do you have a, do you or the recipient have a personal or family relationship with you? If you're emailing your dad, your brother, your cousin, no problem. You, you don't need their consent. If you know them uh, and you have some sort of personal relationship, this could be even a business relation relationship, you should be good. Uh, you know, if you met the person at the convention and shook the hand and actually, you know, uh, get to know them, that's essentially personal relationship, so it doesn't fall under the castle legislation. The next question to ask is, is this message sent from or received by a computer system in Canada? So if you're contacting your customers, uh, you're located in Canada and contacting customers in USA, um, that will still essentially this CASA legislation apply to you or vice versa. If you're, uh, you're contacting essentially uh, someone in Canada, essentially uh, that legislation still, uh, you know, uh, applies to you. The next thing is, is this commu uh, communication considers commercial activity. And this also, uh, as commercial activity, they have a definition for nonprofit as well. So nonprofit also on, uh, falls under this commercial activity uh, category. Uh, so if you're sending any type of marketing information, that's considered as commercial activity. So as long as the answer to these boxes or these questions are yes, you must follow these rules and regulations. There's really no ifs and buts about it. Now, the, the tough question is always, okay, you know, what happens if I don't comply? Uh, you know, a lot of, you know, people that I've asked, they say, oh, you know, this is essentially, it's not going to hurt my business, you know, they're not going to come after, you know, just my shop, you know, uh, my, you know, school is much smaller or my studio is much smaller for government to come after it. Uh, honestly, uh, none of us here or, you know, really anywhere other than the, you know, uh, anyone other than government uh, 
entities are able to actually fully answer this question and tell you that you know you're safe or not. It's essentially like filing taxes and getting audited. It could happen to anyone, you know, technically based on the rules. However, this doesn't mean that you should stop marketing. Uh, Essentially, these rules and regulations have been put in place uh, to stop marketers. But you know, for a regular business to essentially send marketing information, that's fine. You just need to do your best to comply with the rules and regulations. Um, but if, for whatever reason, you fo you know you do not follow the rules and regulation, the government decides that they want to go after your business. There's there are very stiff penalties uh, basically uh, introduced. For sole uh, proprietaries, there are up to $1 million in fines. And for corporations, up to $10 million in fines. So obviously, these numbers are very big numbers. Um, so the fines are very extensive. Now, after 2017, in addition to these fines, which the government can actually find, there's also, uh, you know, uh, personal lawsuits that you know each individual can file against your business as well. So that would be also added on top of this. So um, it's very very stiff. So do tr do your best to be able to comply with the rules and regulations. I cannot again answer the question if the government will go after a small business or not, but the rules and regulations are there. Um, and should be followed to avoid any risk. So there are a couple of dates that you really need to save and you really need to know it up hard. And these dates are one, July 1st of 2014, so just in a few days. Um, and this is when the CASA legislation will fully go into effect. Um, it will start, uh, you know, at that point, you will start collecting and tracking expressions from all your new contacts. So moving forward, if you get a new student or new lead, you must have consent to be able to actually communicate with them. Um, uh, to express consent, you need uh, you need uh, essentially uh, permission from them. Uh, obviously, depending on type of relationship, you might again have implied consent for a certain period of time. Um, and you need to have a fully uh, good plan of how you're going to clean up your existing contact list. Um, you know, to essentially to make sure that you don't communicate with people that you don't have consent and, uh, you know, essentially, uh, you know, plan to essentially get consent from your existing contact list. And as I mentioned, um, you know, July 1st of 2017, that's when the grace period for CASA compliance expires. So um, after that, it's essentially it's open water for any parties to actually sue a specific business due to essentially um, being uh, re uh, due to receiving marketing information without having consent, having provided consent. So these are very, very important dates. Make sure you remember them, uh, you know, especially as July 1st, 2017. Now, if there are anyone in the group right now or in the webinar today that understands uh, or knows about can spam uh, this is essentially the spam regulations in the United States and you know kind of are uh, wondering what is the difference between castle and can spam I actually put together a chart uh, to essentially fully explain uh, what are the differences so with castle legislation uh, that applies to all digital communication so it doesn't matter what type of information you're sending it out as long as it's digital information which again falls in the category of text messages voice broadcasts or voice at all, overall uh, email or social or any type of electronic messages uh, falls under this category for can spam it's essentially all applies to only emails that have a primary purpose of commercial so it's very different. Actually, Castle is much more strict compared to CanSpam. Um, the other very important, essentially, uh, difference is that Castle follows an opt-in only, essentially, uh, process. So meaning that uh, the individual has to essentially opt in to receive information from you. But CanSpam re uh, regulations uh, has an opt-out as an acceptable method, meaning that you can start emailing people and as soon as they opt out, you shouldn't email them anymore. So it's can spam is much easier to follow in perfect mind and all of our communication currently follows the opt out and can spam reg legislation. 
The fines are obviously very, very different. Uh, you know, as you see, it's between one to ten million dollars in fines for Castle versus sixteen thousand dollars per violation for can spam. Um, uh, the Castle uh, fines again. This is per violation. So if you, you know, it could be, it could, you know, add up to a, a much more significant number. The one thing they have uh, in common that both methods must have an unsubscribe mechanism so there must be a method for people to say I don't want to get your you know communication from you anymore so the biggest question of all is how does perfect mind help with this um, now we are going to be rolling out a different plan and following uh, you know to do different things to essentially help you with what is going on with the castle legislation um, the first thing we're going to do, we're going to acquire express consent or we're going to attempt to acquire express consent from your existing contacts. What we will be doing, we will be sending an email on your behalf on the following dates. Uh, we're going to try three different attempts as we know you're not going to get people to provide the express consent on the first attempt. Uh, so as of today, as of actually earlier today, the emails have been going out to all your contacts with your business information, all the information it requires. The email essentially will be a very generic email will saying that we do require your permission to communicate you with you further uh, and it you know has all the necessary information that's required from your business. There's a button that I can send and by them clicking on that button, the system will record that email that is essentially in the safe list to be able to be contacted moving forward. Uh, we're going to send an email on today. 27th and on the 30th. These are the three con essentially attempts that we're going to make on your behalf to be able to get the consent or express consent uh, from your existing contact list. The other thing we're going to do, we're going to actually create an automated email in everyone's system that's going to automatically send an email out to ex uh, receive express consent from any new contact that you put into the system. So it seems like it, it works like an automated email essentially and we'll have similar type of uh, material as has been provided in the, you know, my original point, the email that's currently going out. And those emails, you've probably seen stuff coming out from, uh, coming out from Champions Main Perfect Mind in the past couple of days. It looks exactly like that minus the logos obviously. And we'll have your business name and information instead. Um, the next thing that we're going to do, we're going to, you know, in our email system, uh, we're going to essentially make it in a way that essentially in the background of the email system, if you send an email to all your contacts, the system is going to check which ones you have consent from and which ones you don't, and the ones that you don't are not going to receive the emails. So you will receive, and you know, if you uh, review your email reports, you might see a lot more, uh, you know, or less deliveries because we just we're not, we want to protect you essentially. So if you do send an email to everyone and uh, you know half of them don't have consent, we're not going to send the emails to those, that half. So only 50% of people are going to get the email. Some other features that will be coming soon, we're going to uh, provide a report in the Perfect Mind system that you're going to be able to see who, who or what emails have made the consent, what type of consent that you have from them, is it implied or is it expressed. In addition to that, you'll see the IP address, all the information that you legally require in case that, you know, uh, that becomes a legal matter. And one thing you can do with that information, if you see essentially, you know, email addresses that are not part of that list that you do require to get consent from, you'll be able to utilize other methods such as, uh, you know, contacting them through phone or uh, getting a written consent from those people and manually add them to the list. Uh, the last method is an email template. We're going to create an email template uh, and essentially have it saved in the template section of the emails. Um, and this template can be used by you manually to send out uh, the consent to any individual. So maybe you speak to a student and they say, oh, you know, I didn't get that email or maybe I deleted it accidentally. Uh, thinking it was spam maybe and so what you're able to do, you can send that email one more time to that uh, student and have them provide the consent right there. Uh, one thing I suggest, I think it would be the easiest, at least for your existing students and uh, customers, uh, through the check-in app, you're able to actually send an email to all the attendees of a certain event. So, you know, you know, if basically, uh, you know, you're instructing a class or, you know, 
or an event. And uh, during the class and event, you can actually explain uh, this CASA legislation and uh, the, the fact that you do require permission from your students. Send an email to all the attendees of that event right at that moment and tell them that, you know, when they essentially get access to their emails, if they can provide consent. This way, you can significantly improve your consent rate. Now, you know, this is essentially very, very tough legislation that's been put in place. There are pros and cons, obviously, on it. Um, you know, the interesting thing to know that, you know, actually Canada is not even on the top 10 lists of spam countries in the world. Uh, so, you know, they, we've already have very tough, you know, essentially regulations behind that. And the, uh, the companies have been respecting people's, uh, essentially, uh, you know, email addresses and uh, privacy uh, to this point. But one thing that, you know, the positive side of this, you know, is when you start actually getting used to it and uh, go through the process of actually getting the consent, that means each recipient that's receiving your email is going to get less junk in their inbox. So meaning that more attention is going to go towards the emails that you send out. You know, we all, you know, open our email every day and, uh, you know, we have to delete tons of emails from marketing emails from companies that we don't even know how they got our email accounts. Uh, well, when this gets kicked in and, you know, as over time we get less and less and less emails and more important and re relevant emails in our inbox, then our attention will go towards these emails and reading them and fully understanding them. So your message to the ones that will receive it will become a lot louder, essentially. Um, and perhaps, you know, this is something that, you know, will essentially be adopted by different uh, countries as well. But right now it's only something that stands uh uh, in Canada. Uh, the attempts that I show here in Perfect Mind, again, these are the things that we're going to do to be able to help out with the current situation. However, we recommend to also utilizing your own uh, methods to be able to express uh, or receive these express consents. Uh, try to spend the time to get the express consent rather than relying on the implied consent. Again, it's going to you know, benefit you, know, you know, longer. Uh, however, uh, you know, uh, you know, don't and on, don't only rely to essentially, uh, you know, the information that you see uh, presented to you, and you know how Perfect Mind is going to try to help. Uh, as I mentioned, you know, have sign up sheets at the business, have people sign it up, uh, essentially uh, update your, you know, agreement uh, templates. Uh, if you are using a custom merge document for your agreements or waiver documents for your leads or brand new students who walk in, uh, make sure that there is a consent section on that. So as you're getting permission for them or uh, having them to uh, provide you, uh, you know, uh, take responsibility of their own health, um, you know, make sure that they also provide the consent. So, you know, it doesn't cause you any issues moving forward. Uh, and, you know, as we move forward, we're going to also introduce technologies that's going to help you with this method, uh, with this process. Uh, one thing is, Perfect Mind is only the tool, the emailing tool. Uh, the responsibilities of, you know, essentially breaking the, and not following this legislation falls under the business itself not under the tool that is used. So do make sure, again, that you follow the po uh, policies. Uh, this is with any other tool that you see out there as well. Uh, it's essentially, it's uh, the responsibility on the, is under the person who utilizes that tool. It could be your Gmail account, it could be your Outlook, it could be Perfect Mind, to send out the information. So make sure you actually follow the rules and legislation to the uh, best of your ability. Uh, that's all I have today for you guys, uh, and thank you for attending the webinar. We're just going to go on uh, question and, uh, some questions. Uh, I do see a couple have come up. Uh, so um, a question has came from uh, Dorothy, and she's asked, if you do not get consent from your automatic emails to my contacts, do you delete the emails from my con uh, contacts? I have all my clients sign, sign forms when they sign up at the studio and ask email permission, so I don't really need email consent. Um, Dorothy, um, 
again, email is just one of the methods. How the email mechanism works, we obviously keep the contact information in the system. Uh, however, it works like kind of unsubscribe, uh, unsubscribe in, uh, that you currently have in Perfect Mind. So although you have the emails, when the emails are sent, the system will exclude the emails that you don't have consent to. We're also going to create a mechanism that is going to allow you to manually mark a contact that has provided you consent. So this way, you know, from the ones that you have actually had them uh, sign in a sheet at the business, you're able to go onto that contact record. There will be a button. It's not presented today, but it will be very soon in the next couple of days that will allow you to mark that person as that they have provided you consent. So this will essentially put that contact back into your safe list. If you are getting uh, you know, the consent using a sign-up form, please make sure that you have the necessary information on that sign-up form. As I mentioned, you must have your business name. You must have essentially your business address. Some other business uh, contact info such as email address, uh, website, or phone number. And also uh, two pieces of information say, uh, uh, reflecting that the person is able to unsubscribe at any moment. In addition, that they are agreeing to a specific piece of information being sent to them. So as long as you have all this information, it is to completely fine for you to actually get the consent using an offline method. And then you are able to mark those contacts in the database so your future communication can go to them from automated emails to mass emails. Um, Jeff has asked if contact changes their email address, will you have to get the express consent signed again? Um, that's a very good question. Um, I would do that just in case, uh, you know, technically the consents are not on the contact or on the email address or the communication method. So I would do that just to be safe, uh, you know. Uh, uh, you know, I, you, you know, if, you know, essentially the government comes after, you might be able to prove a point that, you know, you had a consent from an individual and the email address is in, but let's not go there and just keep it safe for yourself and get the consent every single time. In perfect mind, we're going to take consents based on email addresses, not contacts. So um, that's how we're going to record it. So if uh, consent has been provided on a certain email and the email is shared between five contacts, all of them will have consent. Uh, Tim has asked uh, if I can show a slide of when Castle will uh, essentially uh, apply. So essentially as long as you are sending an electronic uh, communication method either by text, voice, video, image or email or uh, you know, sorry this uh, slide I see that you know I've just typed it incorrectly and as long as you don't have a personal or family relationship with the person or if uh, and, and the message is being sent from a computer or received by a computer system located in Canada and lastly if uh, it's uh, communication is considered commercial activity and the commercial activity I have they described it is pretty vague so really anything can be considered as commercial activity if you're talking about your birthday parties it's special events anything can be a commercial activity uh, Tim we will make the recordings of this webinar because uh, we essentially want to go through the uh, half of the webinar again I do apologize but uh, you know uh, we have the we're going to make the recording available in the next little bit so you can essentially uh, review uh, the recording again. I do highly recommend everyone to uh, essentially search Castle legislation and go to the government website and read fully about it. I've covered, uh, essentially I provided a summary of uh, all the information. Uh, but uh, but there is a lot more details involved. Again, to be safe, I highly recommend each business should be very very uh, have a very clear understanding what castle legislation is, uh, as it will be part of our lives in Canada for the next little bit. Well, for you know for a long period of time, actually, probably. <laughs> All right, we've uh, covered all the questions that I could see right now. Um, if the, you guys have any other questions, feel free to type it in now. 
Uh, if not, we can essentially end the session for today. I will present or we'll make the recording available as soon as possible so everyone uh, who uh, you know essentially want to review this webinar again or were not able to actually attend this webinar will be able to get a chance to actually review it. Uh, there's tons and tons of documentation information on this uh, legislation online so again uh, take that time to go through them and learn them fully as again it will be a big part of your of how you communicate to your contacts in Canada moving forward. So it's very important for you to be fully aware of it. All right, it seems like we've answered all the questions and there's no more questions. So, oh, actually one more question came in um, from Johnny Ahmed. Uh, can we add an email consent to the waiver form? Yes, uh, absolutely. Uh, so on, on your waivers or on your contracts, you can actually have a section uh, that essentially, as long as it covers the information that I mentioned, uh, you know, which is your business info, you know, what type of information we receive and so on and so forth. As long as it has that, they, you can you know, essentially combine that with another piece of uh, you know, document that you're already uh, getting to the person to sign. The only thing it is, it, it must be in a section that people can opt into. So it can't be a section that's saying that by signing this contract, you also agree to this basically uh, to receive the communication. It has to be its own term and it has to have a, you know, essentially I agree for that specific term of consent. It can't be, you know, same signature for 19 different things. For this consent can be, uh, has to be its own individual uh, section, but, and has its own uh, uh, essentially uh, opt-in section, but it can be on the same document. Um, Johnny has asked if signature, uh, do you need signature or initial is enough? Um, this is honestly a little bit above my head. Uh, I would essentially, uh, just to be safe, I would try to get the signature, uh, you know, or essentially, you know, if you believe that's going to become problematic for you and initial is better and easier for you, I would consult to your lawyer uh, just to double check. But, you know, if I were you uh, and you are getting an offline method, I would go for signature. Again, these are legal documentation, so the more you do, the better. All right. Again, thank you guys. Thank you everyone for attending this webinar. On behalf of myself and uh, Champions Very Imperfect Mind, uh, we thank you for attending. Uh, essentially, again, uh, do read about the Castle legislation and essentially read all the details because it, it will apply to all small businesses out there. Uh, and it's a very, very important essentially legislation that you know by not following it, it could uh, uh, significantly affect the business. So. Uh, we will, uh, you know, make the recording available uh, very soon. Uh, and uh, and if you do have any questions, feel free to contact myself. My email address is nima nima at championsway.com. Thank you, and have a great day.